Welcome to the Dixie Cryptid Channel. My name's Cameron Buckner, and all we do is tell weird, crazy stories that people send me by email that they claim are true. And man, they are some good ones. I don't know how many we're going to be able to fit in this one, but I'm just going to keep reading until I get tired. So let's start out with this one. The man doesn't say if he wants his name revealed or not. Uh, I don't think he sent his name, just an email address, which I never give out, but let's read his account. He says, I'm a truck driver and I've driven all over and I've seen a lot, but there's one piece of road from Kunch, Texas over to Conroe, Texas that I'll never drive again. Not after what I saw that night. I was driving the highway when something hit the road with a boom. There was a full moon, so I could see it was there, but it wasn't until I got a ways down the road that my headlights hit the body of a 200-pound pig with its back quarter chewed off. I was just beginning to register what I was looking at when something jumped up out of the ditch and crossed both lanes in one step. I was pulling a flatbed with a load of lumber, and I'd just come around the corner, so I was only going five miles per hour. The ditch there was about six feet deep. When it stood up on two legs, I nearly lost control of my bowels. Even standing down in the ditch, there was at least four or five feet of upper body clearly above the roadway. It was covered in long, shaggy red hair with arms that reached down to its knees. It meandered along like it didn't even care I was there, swinging its arms and walking with a weird gait I will never forget. The only words I can find to describe it are werewolf on steroids. Not long after that, I moved to Buna, Buena, Buna, B-U-N-A, Texas. My next door neighbor's dad had passed away and left him his truck. I was parked behind the trailer I was living in, and we were using it for parts storage. One night, I heard a bunch of rattling out there, and I assumed it was my neighbor digging some parts out until I smelled an odor coming through my window air conditioner that was like a rotten skunk sweat running through a backup sewer. <laughs> I know this guy was probably scared, but, oh, man, the... The way you guys describe these smells are just awesome. They're just awesome. Uh, he said it burned his eyes, and it burned his nose. It even burned my throat. It was out there for three or four minutes. The smell was so bad and so strong that I couldn't even take a breath. Worse yet, I was afraid to move and attract the attention of whatever was out there because the windows in those little house trailers aren't more than a sixteenth of an inch thick. It wouldn't have taken much to peel that window open like a sardine can, and I wasn't about to be a sardine. The next morning, I went out and walked around the trailer to see if I could find anything that might tell me what had been there the night before. I keep thinking about that smell. <laughs> Ooh, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm just going to leave this in because uh, i got to move on. Okay, where was I? The next morning, I went out and walked around the trailer to see if I could find anything that might tell me what had been out there the night before. Under the kitchen window, I found a footprint. I'd never seen one like it before. It had three toes with long claw indentions in the dirt. The size of it sent a shiver down my spine. I took a picture of it, but I don't know where it's at. It could be on a computer I have that's broken right now, or maybe it's on an old cell phone. Either way, it's probably lost forever. My trailer was just off of 96 heading out of town, and there were just a few houses and then nothing but forest. My two neighbors, the guy down the road and I, all owned dogs. I had three, and my neighbors each had dogs, and the guy down the road had two pit bulls. Three weeks after I found the footprint, every one of those dogs except my little rat terrier was found dead. Not too long after that, I had gone over to visit my friend and his wife. They lived about 50 yards over from my trailer off the main road. I got there at 8 o'clock, so it was already dark when I stepped through their French doors into the deck for a cigarette. I was scanning the tree line about 20 feet away when I saw a pair of red eyes staring back at me. They had to be nine feet off the ground. 
I stared at it for what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a few seconds. And then I turned around and went back inside. And right away, my friend asked me why I came back in so quickly. I didn't know what to say, so I told him I forgot my lighter. We went back out together with a couple of beers, but the eyes were gone by then. I can't help but wonder why I have these encounters. The first time I saw one was north of Roanoke, Virginia. After that, I didn't go outside at night for a long time. After the incidents in Buena, or Buna, a medicine man and a healer told me that I had great powers and that's why I see them. They're drawn to me for healing. The worst part is the dark forces and the demons. But that story is for another time. Oh, to the writer, what a great story. You you really do seem to attract these things. I mean, I counted one, two, three encounters in your lifetime. And, you know, there's people like me who never see anything. So I'm a little jealous in a way. And you might say, well, think about what you wish for. But I really do wish I could see one. I do. I'm not lying. I really wish I could see one. But thank you for writing this. We had to edit it a little bit. But it wound up being just a fantastic story to share. And I really appreciate the man taking the time to write it down and send it to me. Thank you, sir. All right. <coughs> oh, had something caught in my throat there. All right. This email is from Brad. And here's what he writes. My friends and I are all avid outdoorsmen. Between the four of us, we account for 130 years or more of experience in the woods. We're from Ohio, but on the occasion I'm about to relate, we were hunting wild boar outside of Dunnellan, Florida, near the Ocala National Forest. We arrived at our campsite and set up early in order to make our way into the woods before dark. I was deepest into the woods with my three buddies spread out and situated in various locations between me and our camp. As I sat there waiting for that time to pass, during which the daytime animals settled in for the night and the nocturnal animals woke up and came to life, the woods were split by the sound of a blood-curdling scream. It came from somewhere over by the stand of one of my buddies, but it definitely wasn't him. It wasn't human at all. Frozen by the shock and fear triggered by this ungodly sound, I sat still and listened intently for clues as to what this thing was. A short three minutes that felt more like a few long centuries later, the thing let out another whooping howl. This time it came from a place that seemed impossible to reach in such a short period of time. Assuming there was only one creature, it must have been incredibly fast to have reached that point so quickly. Suddenly, uncomfortably aware of how much further I was into the forest than my friends, I was in a mental battle with myself as to whether I was brave enough to stay where I was a bit longer or hightail it out of there as fast as I could, and risk the ridicule I was sure to face for being afraid of that terrible scream. Somehow, I managed to keep myself together and stay in place until 3 a.m. when a low, guttural scream wrenched me from my stand, and I went in. The next morning, I discovered that the others had all gone in as soon as they heard the first scream. One of my friends has hunted for 47 years. He said he'd never heard anything like it before. At that point, we all admitted to being afraid of whatever was out there. Despite the screams we heard the night before, I decided to go back into the woods that night to hunt. I chose a stand a bit closer to camp, thinking that would alleviate my fears some. Right away, I noticed how quiet the woods were. It wasn't that peaceful time around dusk. It was heavy silence. The crickets weren't chirping and the birds weren't singing and no squirrels were barking or running around. I didn't hear any of the typical forest animals at all. It was just me and the mosquitoes. I wasn't settled into my stand for long when things started being thrown at me. 
Each time, it was something a little bigger, until finally a three-inch thick by three-foot-long log was thrown at me like a javelin from a distance of 80 yards or so. I got the message. I needed to leave. As I was getting my stuff together to get out of there, another smaller stick hit me in the head as if to say, stay out. We eventually learned that the gentleman who owns the woods won't go into them alone. Every other time we'd made the trip down there to hunt, we'd bagged a hog. That trip, we never saw a single animal, not one. That was the only time we ever had anything strange happen, but I'm still not taking any chances. When I hunt that area, like the landowner, I don't go in alone. I'm often ridiculed for telling this story. It doesn't matter to me. I don't know what was in those woods, but it wasn't an animal and it was not a human. Oh man, that's creepy. That's a creepy story. I'm pretty impressed you stayed there till 3 a.m. I don't know how much longer that was from the first scream to the next one, but dude, if I'd have heard that scream and then heard it closer a few minutes later, I'd have been, I'd have been hightailing it back to camp. I'm not a chicken. I'm not a chicken, but if I hear something like that, uh, it's time to leave. Dude, I, you've got my admiration. You got a big set, brother, for staying in there till 3 a.m. I'd have been scared to death. Great story. Thank you to the writer, Brad. I appreciate you sending it to me. And uh, let's move on to another one. All right, and this last story is pretty good. Uh, I think it's real good. He wants to be on, The writer wants to be anonymous. It is a man. So we've narrowed it down to half the population, but y'all still don't know who he is because he doesn't want, it, he doesn't want you to know who he is. That's what anonymous means. Here's what he writes. I want to be anonymous because I've learned most people are still skeptics and don't mind laughing in your face. I need to preface this letter by stating my oldest son has had two different cryptid sightings as a cross-country truck driver. Both times the occurrences were with another person, with each seeing the same thing. His first was as a trainee while accompanied by his trainer, driving west on Highway 40 coming through the Ozarks. When they both caught sight of what was described as a huge auburn-colored man-like creature squatting at a creek, scooping water to its face as they were crossing a bridge. About a year later, the second incident would be frightening, causing him to call me right after the event. He and his co-driver were delivering a load near a major soda company located out in the middle of nowhere, as he put it, deep in the northeastern woods of the United States. They had been parked for an hour this night, preparing to wait until morning to unload. When he called, I could clearly hear distress in his voice, as well as the female driver who was in the background still sounding terrified by whatever they had just witnessed from inside of the cab of the truck. It was reported as having horrifying big red glowing eyes and was at least 10 feet tall by comparison to the tractor trailer that was directly in their line of sight. It was 100 yards in front of them as they both watched this massive creature walk out of the shadow of the light pole as it seemed to be investigating another truck across the parking lot just on the edge of those dark woods. I tried to persuade my son to share his stories on one of the Bigfoot sites he has been researching and listening as of late, but it has been a challenge seeing as he already told his family, a few friends, and his wife's family of these stories, only to come away feeling foolish from the laughs, disbelief, and accusatory looks of being a fanciful storyteller. Now, for me personally, I could easily give several strange happenings I have taken part in throughout my life. Everything from near-death experiences to a homeless man giving me a prophetic message when I was 10 years old before he disappeared from sight through deep, fresh snow without leaving footprints. I will admit, I'm hoping you share this letter so maybe my son will hear it, recognizing the stories and then he will no longer be apprehensive to share his encounters. I can relate two creepy events that occurred with one being with my eldest son back when he was 12. 
I had pretty much put the event out of my mind until he brought it back up later after his scary encounter as an adult that night in the dark parking lot. And I will try to be brief, but I do need to set the stage of my surroundings and the happenings in life. I was born in the Deep South, but mostly grew up in the cold air of Northwest Indiana. Yet I had always yearned to go back home. You know how they say you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Well, that was me for sure. Because as soon as I became an adult, I could hardly wait for an opportunity to move back down south. It was an early spring Saturday morning in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I was living in the Pleasant Valley subdivision east of Highway 61 South, roughly a mile from the Mississippi River. They have since built two schools west of the location of my first incident. This part of the state is mostly rolling hills, hollows, and it's covered with many trees, plus greenery as far as the eye can see. I was looking forward to taking each child out for a go-kart ride that day because it was spring break for them. My two sons from my first marriage had come to live with us last summer, and I also have two stepdaughters that are also close to them in their ages, plus a newborn son. My plan was to start out with my oldest son, since he had missed out on a few years with me. On this day, instead of just going down to the end of the cul-de-sac like I would normally do with them, to the edge of the woods where I would spin a few donuts in the dirt, and then let them drive back to the yard for the next driver. I decided to take my son out of the subdivision a few hundred yards back down the main road. I had seen a gated path, overgrown with weeds and shrubbery leading into the thick forest, and I figured this would be a nice place to check it out with him, allowing us an extended ride together, and from there we could drive all the way back. I headed out onto Dana Road, driving west along the gravel shoulder to go around this locked gate giving us access to this closed road. I was swerving back and forth on the narrow path all the while enjoying watching the excitement in my son's eyes as he was scanning the surrounding trees. We were heading deeper into the dense forest, and after several minutes, I could see a clearing up ahead, which looked like wide enough for me to do a donut. And this was where I could let him drive. As I performed a 360, the go-kart stalled out, as it would do sometimes when I would turn too fast, causing the motor to flood. Once the sound of the cart engine stopped, I noticed an eerie quiet stillness as the dust was settling in the slight breeze that was blowing into our faces. I didn't think much about quietness because we are all about a half a mile southwest of my subdivision. I got off the cart, instructing my son to take the driver's seat while I prepared to start the engine back up and head home. The wind shifted and coming at us from the south. Oh my God, this wind is carrying an awful odor. Funky wet dog smell that is mixed with hog pen scent. (laughs) I'm sorry, these smells just, the description of these smells just gets me. The wind shifted coming at us from the south. Oh my God, this wind is carrying an awful, sour, funky, wet dog smell that is mixed with a hog pen's scent you will get on a humid summer day, which will burn your nostrils. Do you smell that, I asked. I asked my son while turning to see if he he was getting into the driver's seat. But he was not moved and his eyes were transfixed on something in the general direction of where the smell was coming from. He was looking at the thick tree line where it was hard to make out anything. And I shouted to him, do you smell that mess? I glanced in the direction of his gaze, but I saw nothing. And he turned to me and I can see his eyes are glossed over and he has a look of fear as if he has seen a ghost or something. Yeah, I smell it, he said. Instantly, a chill overtook my body, making every single strand of hair stand on end. I was feeling a real sense of dread, and I don't know why. My heart started pounding uncontrollably fast, as if it was trying to escape the cavity walls of my chest. 
There was immediate fear upon us both with my concern being my son's safety, yet my mind was racing with many questions flashing through my head within a millisecond. It was as if I was frozen in a state of temporary shock. Why in the hell did I bring him all the way back here in these damn woods, is what I was asking myself, and what in the world is causing this rotten smell? Are we in some type of danger? Do we need to get out of here now? My next thought was the same as my last, and I quickly pulled the string on the go-kart so hard that I was surprised it didn't snap, but the engine luckily fired back to life. I jumped in the driver's seat without putting on my seat belt, and I jerked the steering wheel in the direction from which we had come. Before I knew it, I was throwing dirt and grass behind. The Briggs and Stratton engine was blowing smoke, straining hard to move this cart. I never looked back. I was desperately hoping to see that yellow lock gate come back into my view so we could go back around it. I turned on to Pleasant Valley Drive and I pulled to the shoulder. I was still shaking, but my adrenaline was starting to subside, allowing me to feel a little safer by being back on the street near the houses of my neighborhood. I took this time to ask my son if he had seen anything, and his reply was, Dad, there were big, dark, scary-looking eyes staring right at us from in the tree branches, but I couldn't see anything else but the eyes. I thought something had moved when I first started smelling that, so I was trying to see what it was, but I only saw those eyes, and they just disappeared while I was looking at them. That's what scared me. My son assured me that the eyes just vanished into the shadows of the branches. I made sure he was calm, and then had him promise me that he would not tell my wife, nor his brother or sisters, because I knew I would not hear the end of it. I can't honestly say what was in the trees because I didn't really see anything. I did get a sense of imminent danger, though. But my son, on the other hand, saw a set of eyes, and I had no reason not to believe him. The fear on his face was enough for me to know that we needed to get out of the woods. My second account was with an uncle, and it would happen late in the summer of the same year. We had decided to go pick berries. My uncle said they probably still grew wild everywhere out there, near this old farm where we lived back in the 60s. I was all excited to hear this, knowing that it had been years since I set eyes on this place. The farm is in Yokina, Mississippi, and it's not far from the Big Black River, the exact location where Campbell Swamp Road runs into a dead-end dirt road named Sherrard Drive. We made our way out to the property, arriving at 9 a.m. It was deep in the backwoods of Warren County, where there are neither streetlights nor electricity lines. We arrived, and I had to stop at the lock gate to look down on the property from the road, which dead ends at the bottom. The house was long gone, but I could clearly see the old chimney still standing in the middle of what is now a small lake formed by years of the Big Black River flooding. This road has a drainage ditch, and that led to our search in the area for muscadines. I could see from the car that this hollow was no more than 50 yards away, and I was noticing how the foliage was super thick with these long vines draped and tangled over the oaks, dogwoods, and magnolia trees. After the nostalgia of admiring the beauty of my childhood stomping grounds, we stepped toward the shallow ditch. I heard rustling of leaves in the forest floor, crickets chirping, plus this faint sound of a woodpecker knocking off in the distance. Once in the ditch, we saw a large cave dug deep into the ground of the embankment, and it caused me to pause. My uncle was joking with me, telling me that it was a big black bear's den. He said, I hope you brought a pistol with you just in case we come across one out here, and he laughed at me. Of course, I wasn't finding this to be funny at all, but I did have a twenty-five pistol in my pocket. Now I was scanning the ground for bear prints more than I was looking for muscadines. My uncle was tickled pink, seeing me a little scared. I asked him to quit laughing at me because he was laughing so loud it was getting me out of my comfort zone. But it would only be a few seconds later when he would become just as afraid as I was. 
I took a few more steps and there it was. It was some kind of huge animal track in the semi-damp ground. Hey, check this track out. Look how big it is. And he stepped over to see with his own eyes because he obviously was thinking I was pulling his leg. I put my size 12 shoe next to the track to do a comparison. What the hell, he said. This ain't no damn bear, boy. Look how wide across the toe that is. I don't see any claw marks either. Looks more like a barefoot man track, but that's impossible for a man's foot to be this big. Something ain't right here. This is no swamp cat either. This can't be real. Yeah, he was scared now. Not ten seconds after his loud reaction to seeing this weird track is when we both noticed the silence. There were no sounds at all. And then suddenly we heard it. I guess the best way to describe it was to say a powerful long roar. The sound resonated through my whole body, echoing twice throughout the valley. The feeling I got was similar to standing close to a train as a horn blows. Whatever made that noise seemed to be coming towards us. The vines in the trees were now beginning to swing, and we could tell something was coming at us walking upright because these sounds of heavy footfalls were hitting the ground. One powerful boom after another, and it was coming fast. I didn't have time to say let's go. My uncle had already took the first frantic step back to my car before I could even think about it. By the time he reached the car, I was there unlocking the passenger side so he could get in. I started the car and put it in gear and was trying to peel off, but the dirt had my car sliding side to side in slow motion. And at the same time, I was looking over in the direction of a holler, and there she was. Yes, I could see one of her breasts. The beast was partially hidden behind a large tree, just standing there watching us with her top lip rolled back. She was making a terrifyingly menacing frown, showing her large, dirty horse teeth, which were flanked by long canines. I noticed her skin had a look of smoke gray in color, at least the part I could see through the long, black, stringy-looking hair, which was circled around her face. Large fingers were visible as she gripped the tree. My head was hurting because of seeing this mythical boogeyman that they had been telling me about years ago when I was a little boy. I had grown to believe that it was an old tale just to make the kids scared at night. Man, was I ever wrong. My tires caught traction, although the car was already fishtailing before I realized my uncle was telling me to slow down. He didn't know how I knew it was a female anyway. He said emphatically, how did you know that? He then lit me a cigarette and told me to relax so I could tell him exactly what I saw. I started to settle down and was far enough from the area and we began laughing about the experience. We both chain-smoked all the way back to civilization, vowing to tell everyone what we went through. This would be a big mistake and a waste of our breaths. Our family members thought we had been getting stoned and then made the whole story up. They laughed in our faces. It was okay, though, because I don't think I would have believed it either if I had not seen it for myself. People can think these creatures aren't real if they want to, but I know what I saw. I will never feel alone in the deep woods ever again. Needless to say, our muskydine hunt lasted no more than five minutes total, and I have never been back out that way again to Yokina, Mississippi. And that's the end of the story. And uh, this story had not been edited, and the writer was switching from first-person narrative past to first-person narrative present and that's hard to do a little bit. I get a lot of those, and it's no big deal. It's no big deal. But the story may not have sounded just perfect, and I want to apologize to the writer. When I first read it, it kind of looked like it didn't need any editing, but it needed a couple of checks. Hey, but I got through it. I got through it okay. The story is great. I mean, he actually had a visual sighting. He he was so close to this thing, he could make out features like breasts on the female Bigfoot. And he saw canine teeth and square horse teeth and a frown and a lip curled up. Just the image of that is creepy to me. But I thought this was a great story. I've had it a long time and I finally got to share it with you. And I hope you enjoyed it. 
all right i've got uh, something i want to show you here at the end of this video uh if you're it's it has nothing to do with bigfoot stories but i want to show you a piece of equipment that i've been using that some people have been asking about so i thought i'd show you uh, if you leave now thank you for coming by we got tons and tons of stories to do in the upcoming months and i appreciate you Okay, here is the uh, uh, the thing I wanted to tell you at the end of the video. It's not a big deal, but uh, I've been putting these videos up uh, on my videos, the visual part of it, uh, bike riding and walking with the dogs, and it looks like a drone is real close to me and flying around. And uh, actually, I'm I'm using some people have asked, so that's why I'm telling you, a uh, it's a new 360 camera. It's it's been out for a year or two. This is the latest version of it. This camera is called the Insta360 ONE X2. My wife bought it for me for my birthday back in August. And so what, how it works is uh, it's got a little cover on it here. Uh, this isn't a good review. I, I'm not trying to do a review of this. I'm just showing you what it is. And now I want to tell you something about it. But it's got a lens on both sides. And here is the, uh, you can see what you're filming right here on this screen. Uh, I can turn it on. If I can figure out where the on button is. You'll see it c come up. And then you can see me in the, in the camera. And if I turn it around, now I can see the monitor, but here's what this thing does. It captures everything around you in a, a 360 degree sphere. It captures everything. The angle of the camera, I think is about 190, 210 degrees, which, uh, you know, half of a sphere is 100 and, uh, 180 degrees. So it's getting more than 360 degrees and it has AI technology that splices those images together and the magic happens in the editing so when you take it out and you film anything you bring it back in and you pull up the editing software that Insta360 provides you download it from the internet it's called Insta 360 studio 2021 there's a desktop version and a mobile phone version you can edit it either way and the magic happens in the editing because you can drag your screen and you can during the editing you're only getting the frame that you want and so you can make yourself do flips you can make it look like you're corkscrewing through a <laughs> i don't know through obstacles in, in, in an airplane or it's really cool and i haven't even tapped the the potential of it but i really loved it my wife bought it for me for my birthday i had been talking about it and it it was just too much money i didn't want to i didn't want to buy it but she goes so let's she just got it for my birthday i just love that girl and so i've had a lot of fun with it and what i do is it comes with a a selfie stick uh, I've got it on a selfie stick, but here's with a here's the camera just by itself, and you can you can just hold it. You you can walk around like this and hold it, but if you put it on a selfie stick, the technology is so that when you hold it out here, you can hold it in any position while you're walking or riding your bike. You can hold it behind your head. You can hold it everywhere and it captures everything, everything around you. And from that position where the camera is and you can go into editing and make some really cool looking videos. And what it does is the uh, technology and the software eliminates this selfie stick. So it doesn't look like you can see probably me holding it when I'm walking. You can see my hand out. But like if it's on my bike, it looks like there's a drone flying in front of me and it's uh, it's not. How I attach it to my bike is I bought this little clamp off of Amazon. You just screw it on the 
screw it on the end here. You get it positioned right. You know, you do all your stuff, clamp it on your handlebars. You can clamp it on your seat post. You can clamp it on the roll bar of your truck. You can clamp it on the mirror. You can use a, I have a, uh, this thing, like I'll put it on the four wheeler or the ATV. It's a suction cup. It suctions to the top. And this thing is flexible and it moves around. It's a really strong cup. It doesn't come off. And uh, it just fits on this uh, quarter inch thing here. But here's the deal. As I've used this, I was thinking to myself uh, about uh, two people who would really, uh, two, two type of people who film things other than the creative filmmakers uh, who this would be really beneficial to. And uh, first, hunters who film their hunts. You could set this thing up. You could rig up a, something on your deer stand, even with this clamp. You can clamp it on the something on your deer stand. Extend this selfie stick all the way out. And it's about four, four and a half feet long. And they make longer ones. There, there are longer ones. You can run it up there, turn it on, and let it run. You can control it from your mobile phone. So you don't have to keep it running all the time, but like when you see a deer coming in or you hear some noise, you can reach down to your phone and turn that camera on. And you don't have to frame a shot. You, The camera is capturing everything around you. So if a deer or turkey's coming in behind you and you're looking this way, it's getting that animal coming in behind you. Uh, and you could do awesome videos of, uh, you know, calling turkeys in, deer, whatever, what, whatever you're doing. The, the beauty of it is it captures everything and it's pretty good quality. It says it captures it in five point something K, but that is the size of the image, <clears throat> but that's for the whole 360, uh, area that it's 5k. It's about 30 frames per foot. If it's in HDR, I think it's recording in 24 frames per uh, second frames, not frames per foot, frames per second. And, uh, but, uh, an HDR gives you a little more rich color, especially on a cloudy day. It doesn't wash out the sky and all. But anyway, that's just technical stuff. And the other people that I thought about who would uh, benefit from this are people who are looking for Bigfoot in cryptids. And, you know, this camera is really small and they make, um, uh, you know, things that go on your hat, you can, you, you could rig something up on your backpack or somewhere on your body and just have this camera up there running while you're on a hike or you're on an investigation. Or if you think something's in the woods with you, you could turn this on and look, you might could trick a Bigfoot with it. You, a Bigfoot, you, they see you looking forward. I think they're so smart. They have to stay out of your line of sight, but it's not out of this camera's line of sight. It's capturing everything in front and in behind you. And once you capture the video, you bring it into the software on your desktop or on your mobile phone. You can pan around and you can uh, render a video. You can, in other words, make a video of everything behind you. If you walk for 30 minutes, you can make a video for 30 minutes of everything behind you. Then you can go back and you can turn the view around and get everything in front of you. You got 30 minutes of that and render that. Then you can go back and get everything to the right, everything to the left. You can tell it to track a, a dog. For instance, if a dog is coming up behind you that you're walking, like I walk my dogs, uh, there's a feature where you can you can highlight that animal or that whatever that object is. It doesn't have to be moving. It can be stationary. And you can highlight that, and then the editing software will follow that object. So it looks like it's a moving camera, but it's not. It's a 360 camera, and the software is tracking the object. 
So, for instance, if uh, you had a dog running up behind you and you wanted to get that dog way behind you and catch it going by you and out in front of you, you can tell the software to grab that object and hit go, and it'll render that all the way through. And and so it's just really cool. But some people have asked about this. It's the Insta360 1X2. I haven't covered near everything this thing will do. And I have, and I haven't used it to its full potential and I probably never will because I just do videos for just to kind of run in the background because it is YouTube and it is a, it's a visual platform. So there has to be something visual with it, a picture or whatever. I've never liked just putting, you know, images or pictures. I want to keep something moving because you can watch it as you listen to the stories. So that's the big secret. It's not magic. It's just cool technology that uh, people are selling out on the market right now. And uh, professionals use a real expensive versions of this. They're real big 360. They're big sphere cameras. I've seen some of them. Surveyors, people in construction, people surveying roads, all kind of things. And so the technology was invented for that. And then they shrunk it down and it's doesn't have near as many features and and uh, all the things that the real expensive ones do but it's great for consumers like me people who will spend three four five hundred dollars on something like that which is probably too much money but if you do this kind of thing and you enjoy you know <laughs> making being creative in some way these are pretty fun. So that's, it's not magic. It's the Insta360 1X2. All right, there's the explanation. The next person that asked me in the comment, I'm just gonna refer to this video and tell them to go to the end and watch it. Okay, you guys, thanks for watching this video. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. So I'm gonna figure out how to turn this thing off. Stop recording. Oh, <laughs>